Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast, the podcast that bridges wisdom from generation to generation. And today's episode is a great one for basketball coaches. We have Chris Oliver, the founder of Basketball Immersion, Basketball Podcast, and Immersion Videos. As an expert in basketball decision training, he coaches, trains, and mentors coaches to maximize their players' potential and enjoyment of practices and games. Most recently, Chris was head coach at University of Windsor, where he won over 300 games and compiled a 750 win percentage. Wow. In our conversation today, it's a fantastic one for coaches to dive into around decision making, uh, team building, player development, and so much more for basketball coaches, youth sports coaches. It's an amazing one. I learned a lot. I'm already going to change some of my philosophies around it. So without further ado, let's dive in. Hello, Chris, and welcome to the Bridging Impact Podcast. I am thrilled to have you on today because I knew once I saw you at Harvard Westlake at the USA Basketball Academy talking about decision making and sharing some of your thought processes with your your daughter, I was intrigued as a youth basketball coach because I've been trying to think about different ways of engaging kids and helping them discover more of their process. So I'm excited to talk more about that in our conversation today. And so with that, our first question we always ask our guests is, what is your definition of impactful leadership? Wow. Let's start off with a really easy one. Well, first, first of all, great to be, to be able to uh, share the game with you and, uh, you know, happy that you had an opportunity to be able to watch that clinic. I'm sure we'll dive into that a little bit more, but, uh, you know, about impactful leadership, I mean, for me, I mean, it comes back to what what is learning. And learning requires a permanent change in behavior. I feel the same way about leadership. If it doesn't lead to some permanent change, then it's not leadership. So to me, that's a big thing. And uh, obviously, leadership in general maximize the efforts of others, you know, towards the achievement of some goal. And uh, generally, that's as a coach, we're trying to always do that. But if you're talking about impact, then we're talking about it leading to some type of permanence. Okay. Talking about some type of permanence. I'm kind of curious. I would love for you to share a little bit more about your journey to how you even discovered like this, you know, sort of permanence for your definition of leadership and more of your journey as a basketball coach and thought leader in this space. Yeah. I mean, permanence, if we're talking about permanence, we're talking about that my leadership in some way left a permanent imprint or some type of permits that led to the efforts of others to be able to obviously change or work towards a goal or different things like that. And for me, that comes back to when I was a young person. I mean, the thing I valued the most through my education, through my years, you know, having been coached and then obviously moving into coaching as a young person was that I really valued practical application. To me, a lot of people, I mean, we're, we're great as coaches. We can give list after list of the 10 things I need in the player. And, you know, everyone likes those on Twitter. They get hundreds of likes and everything like that. But, but to me, I mean, what brings power to the list? What brings, you know, some type of energy to the list? And that is what's practical. Like, what does that list actually mean in terms of practical? So, you know, I can list the seven leadership traits of a great coach, sure. But what brings power to it is obviously the application of those things. And that to me is way more important. So, you know, if I'm talking about uh, maximizing leadership or impactful leadership or different things like that, then to me, it's all about the practical impact I've had on someone. And that means permanent impact. Permanent impact. And I like this idea of practicality. And now that I'm coming, kind of coming back and reflecting upon my, when I was able to see you there and honestly, some of the other, you know, speakers talking about that practicality, I think sometimes as coaches, we do things that either, you know, I think remember that look good, right. But we don't necessarily have any practical implications into a game and game play. So can you kind of explain more about how you came to this practical application and, and how you've kind of been fighting the norm of like, it doesn't may not always look good. Well, basketball practice and every practice and, you know, even a classroom teacher, I mean, it's not a dance recital or a dance performance. Like it's not meant to be perfect. It's not meant to be this perfect duplication of what you taught them. Because again, we're playing in this open environment where we don't know necessarily what the opponent's going to do. You don't know what your teammates are going to do. And that creates this environment of uncertainty. And to me, it's always been better to practice in that environment and to, as much as possible, represent the game environment in practice because the more repetitions we get in the game environment in practice, the more likely we're going to have 
the opportunity to be able to come up with our solutions in a game. And that's a big thing. And this has all resonated with me for a very long time, ever since I did my master's degree. And I sat in the classroom and listened to skill acquisition and more learning and different types of high performance coaches and uh, researchers talk about this, this research. And, you know, maybe at the time it was somewhat new, but I mean, this is 25, 30 years later. And I just find that a lot of coaches still aren't necessarily applying stuff that's based on evidence-based ideas around teaching and learning. Right. So how do you give, you know, different, you know, whether it's players or students, the tools to make those decisions? Because I think sometimes when I found, sometimes when I ask a question to a group of kids at the end of practice, like, what do you learn? They're so used to being told, you know, like, you should have learned this, this, and this. Like, how do you cultivate that, like, their decision-making ability? Well, I mean, one is practice it. I mean, it's like yeah. Yeah. not going to happen without practice. I mean, right. not gonna know any answer. They know any answer because you put them in a situation where they can learn it. And uh, to me, it's better that they come up with their own answer than they come up with my answer. And my answer may be the best answer for them at the beginning, and that's where block practice comes into play or some type of really organized practice that helps them come up with one solution or what I call a must in teaching. But the reality is the game is played with possibilities. So as much as possible, I want to get them to the point that they're playing with possibilities rather than musts. And to do that, we need to, you know, you can talk about learning progressions and all the different things like that. I'm all, I'm all for that. I'm not here to tell anyone they're wrong about anything. But my view of teaching is this, is that I throw them in the deep end. I figure out who can swim or who can swim okay or who can't swim at all. And then from there, you can decide what you actually need to teach and what you need to coach. And to me, like in basketball, that's starting with a lot of 5 and 5 and a lot of small sided games, 3 and 3 or different things like that. Because ultimately, that, that helps me determine what I actually need to break down or what I need to go spend more time on or what we call reconnections, what I need to reconnect them with to be able to be successful in the things that we're trying to come up with. And uh, those must help me direct their learning and shape their learning along with constraints. And then what that leads to is hopefully them having figured out the must and now they can have a possibility, either this or this, or either this or this or this. And as they progress through that, their decision-making improves, their understanding of the game improves. And I generally think their, their ability to not just lead, but their ability to follow improves as well because they're in this environment where they've been empowered to be self-directed, but self-directed within, you know, it's only random it's only random somewhat to the player. I understand what I'm doing as a coach, but for them, they feel this freedom and this permission to be able to evolve as a player. Right. So I'm kind of imagining this in a way of, I'd love to hear like an example or a story specifically, because you talked a little bit about the five on five or the small sided games and like, kind of like almost being a, a doctor in a way of analyzing what they, what decisions they may need to essentially improve upon. But I'd love for you to like paint like a vivid image for those that are listening about kind of what you're talking about. Yeah, that's a great thing to do. Like, I mean, practical examples help us all. So let's say I'm going to teach ball screen defense, and we're going to teach uh, switching on defense. So we're going to go into that 5-on-5 five five situation right away, and I'm going to tell the defense with very little, very little technical information that we're going to switch ball screens. And after the switch of the ball screens, it's live. Offense, figure out what you're going to do after, and defense, figure out what you're going to do after. And, uh, you know, once you do that, and we can do that in the half quarter, we can do that to multiple trips of the floor, say one trip scripted and the rest are live. Either or works fine. Then we can determine, okay, what are we doing some of the right things technically, tactically within the switch defensively? Well, one of those things would be to force the ball back where it came. Don't let it turn the corner around the player who's receiving the ball in a switch. So to me, it's like, okay, are they figuring that out naturally? Well, probably not, to be honest. Some of them might, but really they don't even know why. But that's not the point. The point is, is if I give them all of that information front-loaded, they're going to be, they're going to struggle, and it's going to be messy anyways. So why don't I let them experience it first? And then once they've experienced it, my teaching and my technical points are going to have more of an impact because they've already experienced it within the scope of the game. Mm -hmm. And that's what we mean about creating a task a task representation. This is how it happens in the game. So now you've seen it in a game. Here's how the technical details or the tactical details can help you be better. So it's like giving the test before doing, you know, the practices and like, you know, the, the lecture, so to speak. That way it's kind of like, okay, you see what was on the test, aka the five on five, the three on three. Now let's, you know, 
talk about it and, and break down as you talk about the technical aspect of it. Okay. You have to switch here or you have to switch over there. So with that being said, I, I, I think our the general coaches, our education system, however we want to frame it, that we value, you know, we value grade and compliance. Like we, do, we value that they can do what we teach them and that they comply more mm-hmm. than whether they learn. And to me, what I'm trying to value is can they learn? And once they, I know they can learn and they have the ability to learn and we put them in these situations where they prove that they can learn, that helps empower them more. But it also helps empower me and makes my job easier. So my own mindset, I would value learning more than, say, you know, the grades or the abs- application of a specific skill. Um, and that's really what we're saying. Right. No, I think you bring up a good point and just that's just kind of like a societal thing in terms of education is like we value, you know, I'm even thinking about it like coach says, so you have to do it this way. Right. And I kind of thinking specifically, I'm thinking back to the layups, what you brought up, like we hammer on this is the correct layup footwork. Right. But, you know, someone can go off the the quote unquote wrong foot and still make a shot. Could you kind of dive? Yeah. Are you going to tell them they're wrong? <laughs> like, like, okay, you're not the wrong foot. You need to do like dealing dozen shots I taught you in practice. No, stop the game. Stub, you're wrong. You must do one of my daily dozen moves. You know, one of the six shots I taught you on the right and six shots I taught you on the left. No, we don't do that. So why are we, why are we enforcing it in practice where we don't care about it in a game? Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting point. So, the rebuttal or, or maybe what, what do you, what do a lot of coaches ask you then about that? Like, cause I'm, I'm guessing you, it's layup footwork is definitely one that you probably get a lot of pushback on. I'm guessing. Yeah. And again, my, to me, let me just explain that a little bit more. So I'm not into teaching them the footwork. I'm not into teaching them, you know, this explicit information about how to shoot a layup. But what I don't believe is that we should start with it. I think we should have players experience trying to shoot layups Okay, like, you know, there's a defender on your hip, dribble in, shoot any way you want. That would be the first thing. And that's the first thing I've done with my daughters. First thing I've done with new learners that come in the gym with my daughters is they just dribble in. Okay, now we're going to do stuff with the rim. And there's going to be a defender always beside you. And you're going to shoot any way you want. So what they learn from that is the decision to shoot the layup is more important than the skill of shooting the layup. And that means they're shooting it with what we would call an open window meaning they have a shoulder-to-chest advantage against the defender instead of a chest-to-chest disadvantage. And now they have an opportunity to be able to shoot a win, uh, right up in an open window as opposed to a closed window. And to me, now, once they understand the decision part of it, okay, then I can give them, if they're struggling or, you know, whatnot, then we can go back and we can teach some footwork if we need it. My preference is not to teach any footwork. My preference is they just start to figure out different ways. And with my daughters, because I have more time with them, generally we can set those conditions where it's like, okay, inside foot, wrong hand, inside hand. You know, it does not matter. Like, the point is, did you shoot it when you were open? And that, to me, has more value than explicit information about this technical detail about shooting a layup, you know, inside, outside, up, or whatever it means. I think you're, you're bringing up a good point in a way of, like, I see, like, I'm almost, I'm I'm trying to like imagining kids right now going up for layups in game time, thinking about number one, I want to make an open shot, but number two, coach said I have to do a layup this way. So then they start overthinking and then they just, they just, you know, miss layups. They only have that solution. Well, we don't care about that. In theory, my players will have infinite solutions because we haven't restricted them to one solution. Right. Right. So I'm curious, you know, so, you're kind of talking about the discovery process. So, you know, because there's going to be different situations, right? Like they're either going to take a layup in the half court setting or like in a fast break with a might have to use a different foot or someone's on their left side or their right side. Obviously they're on a different side of the layup. I'm curious, what's your kind of process after they go through kind of like the game sort of application, how do you, you know, kind of, you know, put on your doctor hat or, or whatever hat you want to talk about and kind of like give them some of those other options? Well, and again, this applies to absolutely everything that I would coach or teach. And that is you create the situation for something to evolve. And again, I'm not saying don't give them specific information as they need it. And again, if, if, if you see an example, like in my membership community, I posted two full practices for my daughter's, practices with basically my daughter being the only one that ever had ever been coached before 
some all new learners and you'll see them try and do layups and yeah they struggle and yeah they look messy and yeah they look imperfect and all that stuff is there but what they also are figuring out is they're figuring out why they need to work on certain things so then after that it's my job to create the condition where now they have to say do a step across or a euro type layup well why would they do that well a defender cut them off so now we've set up a situation where the defender's on your hip but they get the first step you take a dribble forward, they cut you off, or they don't cut you off. Well, in the cutoff scenario, either you dribble counter or you step counter. Well, if they don't cut you off, then you step shoulder to chest and you go. So you create the condition for the skill to evolve. And then from there, obviously, if a certain player is struggling, then I will go spend some time on air with them on, hey, this is actually what we're talking about with the footwork. Again, I'm not saying wrong is wrong. I'm not saying block practice is wrong. I'm not t- talking about these this is just all happening in this ecological approach. But what I'm saying is the art is trying to figure out, create the condition and the skill will evolve or the skill will be shaped. And the of paramount importance is the decision, which I think just in a lot of traditional teaching focuses more on the skill, skill, the biomechanical skill, because skills are a decision in my mind, but the biomechanical skill instead of the decision of actually whether I should shoot the open lamp or not. Okay. So you are uh, almost... Correct me if I'm wrong. You're kind of like, I think, flipping kind of the model of like, instead of teaching skill, 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 you're teaching decision now, now skill. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, I'm thinking about what's harder to teach. And you get, like, I don't know, and you travel around whatever sports you're talking about. I've been around soccer coaches, lacrosse coaches, you know, whatever sports you want to say. But I say there's a consistent thing. You know, let's use basketball as just the example. Um, kids can't pass nowadays. You know, these generalized blanket statements or oh, kids can't you know, make decisions or kids have no feel for the game. Well, my argument is, is because it's not the kids, it's how we're teaching the game. And we're teaching the game instead of them having a lot of play opportunity, they're playing a lot of structure, a lot of structure at a very young age and a lot of structure in terms of initial teaching where we feel like we, they have to perfect the layup before they can use it in a game. And to me, that just goes against how I think someone naturally learns and they learn through the mess, they learn through the struggle, and then they learn by putting themselves in these experiential situations to be able to experience it. And for me, that's practice. It's not just games, it's practice. And if my practices are game-like, then they're getting more experiential experiences. Yeah, no, I think that's fascinating. I'm kind of thinking about right now, instead of like starting, so I, I'm trying to get away personally from like the cone, always going at the cone, left of the cone, because I mean, the cone defender doesn't move, right? Like in, in the game, the defender, there's a defender there, right? And so I'm kind of thinking about uh, my pra- my, maybe my practice is now that I might start implementing and changing is playing a little more games. Like I'm thinking even for the younger ones, like a three on two, or some sort of scenarios, letting them go and then teaching them maybe sort of kind of like having my notepad, so to speak, and and picking, I guess, probably one skill. Because if you teach teach too many skills, then you teach none. That's one thing that I'm learning too. So maybe going from, you know, gameplay to recognize, to diagnose, to like then teach maybe, hey, have you thought about this option or this option? Love it. So here are some general things that I've learned through my time. Number one, teach the drill before the skill. So too, coaches, too many coaches go out there in your three-on-two example. You're going to teach the drill to them, and then you're also going to teach the skill at the same time. Teach the drill first. Make sure they're in the drill. Let's say it's a simple constraint. You can shoot or pass. Nobody can dribble. And, uh, you know, even rotation, I would have them figure out their own rotation in terms of that. And that's a player-led thing. Figure out how you rotate and run off. But let's say, okay, I'm teaching the drill. Boom. Now I know we're in the drill. Now I'm going to focus on, okay, hold. Now let's bring it all in and we'll talk about the context of a skill that we're trying to apply right now. Okay, we're trying to apply fight for your feet. That's what I call get two feet to the ground so that you're ready to be able to shoot or in this case pass. So I'm going to teach the skill. Now maybe I then need to go into they do that in three on two shooting, but they're not doing it properly. So we go... I'm going to get a ball, okay, hop three times and fight for your feet. Okay, now go shoot, th- hop three times, fight for your feet. Boom. Okay, and then come back to the three and two. So we're constantly trying to connect it back to the game situation. So I'm not, again, an anti, you know, in terms of, oh, they need a little, they need a little extra attention in the biomechanical skill part. No, that's fine. 
Well, just again, are you reconnecting it? I find too often coaches, again, they teach the drill and the skill at the same time, or as you said, they get too many skill details all at once, which again, the learner doesn't want. The learner wants to experience it first, and then gradually, it's like a buffet. Like Justin can handle two more details, but Chris can't. So, and you'll see me doing that in the practices I put on, on in our membership community for my daughters. You'll see me, I'm coaching my daughter completely differently than I'm coaching other kids because she can get, you know, details, C, D, E, F, et cetera, but the other ones are still on A or B. And that's okay. That's normal too. And I think we try and, you know, just, it's a coaching clinic in practice. But what we know is practice is not a coaching clinic. Practice is both the players. And the way Justin and I would talk about basketball would be completely different than the way we would coach basketball. Right. So I, I have a good, I have a good question for you in terms of something that I want to know more about is, you know, you got, and, and this is almost every team has a different skill levels. If everyone is the same skill level, you must be coaching robots or something. And you talked about your daughter, you, you, you obviously just have a, a better relationship. You work all the time with her, but you have some of these, you know, other players on her team that just they're on, they're at A and B. They're not at letter J yet. So with that, how do you, how do you coach and, you know, make sure that they feel included and heard and create practices that everyone is like involved and engaged in, but are, they're at different skill levels. Well, I want to normalize it. Like, we're not trying to hide it. Like, why is my daughter better than you are at basketball right now? Because she's played more. She's practiced more. She's put more effort into it. So, to me, it's like we try and hide that reality, but it's saying, well, bring it out in the open. I mean, if you want to be better at basketball, you need to put effort into your basketball. So, then we talk about player led development. Okay, what are the things that you're doing on your own? And then we give them things that they can do on their own to get better. And look, the reality is not everyone's going to work to the level that they need to to get better. And they're not going to do stuff on their own. But that's fine. I mean, that is the part of it that is a struggle for a coach. There's no question because we want them all to be good. We generally do. So we try and create player-like conditions for them to get better, and then we try and normalize the realities of it. And that's another thing that I talk about. I'm saying, like, these are realities. Like, I'm saying, hey, you know, if I'm talking, talking to a girl who's, you know, small or short, then I'm going to say, what's your reality? Well, I'm short. Okay, well, that's not a weakness. That's a reality. And I think too often we paint things as weaknesses rather than realities. And it's like, how do you learn to solve problems that's your reality? Well, I had a great 5'9 player who was one of the all-timers at the University of Windsor when I coached there as a college coach. And over the time I coached him, there was another great example that really confirmed my philosophy is if I tried to pigeonhole him and say, you can't jump the pass or you're not allowed to pass around you know, with one hand or different types of musts that coaches put or limitations put player, coaches put on players – he would not have been able to solve problems as a 5'9 player. So to me, instead, I want to create freedom. And how do you create freedom? You create freedom with permission. And uh, permission leads to creativity. Permission, creativity, freedom, all those things go together. Permission, creativity, freedom. I think that's a good one for coaches to write down because I, I totally see what you're talking about. Like, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. You're totally, you know, pigeonholing them. And, and that you're talking about a college athlete, right? He understands, he has multiple decisions. Like, when you're young, there's really only a few decisions that you have because you have less experience in the game. So I, I think with that, what are some of the other, you know, kind of mistakes or not necessarily mistakes, but just, you know, things that, young and new coaches should work on well this concept of, that you're bringing up is great too like i think a lot of college players have gotten better despite the coaching like, they're growing up in those environments of must 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 but i think what they figure out whether it's internally or externally they figure out is okay the coach wants to control me in practice but ultimately he's not going to control me in the game and I really find that. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot, and I find that a lot with female athletes, that they do get control in both senses because they're less likely to kind of say, F you, I'm going to go make a player, I'm going to go do this. And there's a lot of players, you know, male and female, that get limited by that, that compliance part of it. So to me, that compliance part, that control in practice, does carry over to games, but the best players rise above it and get beyond it. And ironically, they're the ones that the coaches say, oh, you know, they're just making plays. And it's like, well, they're making plays despite how you've controlled them in practice. So that type of thing is really important. So I would say that's a big thing is, Mike, why do you care so much that this drill looks perfect, 
if it's not going to be perfect ever in a game? And why do you care so much that they they have their pinky in the right spot on the cold out in practice every day, but every time you practice or play, you know, play games in practice or you play games, you never once substituting or telling a player their pinky's in the wrong place on the closeout. Like, but just to me, so much of it is about compliance and control, where it should be about learning and creating this learning environment. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I, how much of this, these perfect practices do you think are coaches' egos? Well, I, I, listen, defensive coaches, I mean, a lot of them just don't know differently. Right. And again, like, I, I, there are egos certainly involved. Like, if you're coming to practice, Justin, I mean, I used to do that coach with Sale, and that was a perfectly organized practice. But then I quickly learned early on, because my role models all ran perfectly organized practices, but I learned pretty early on that that's not learning. So to me, now you come to my practices and you say, hey, you know, that was messy and chaotic. And I'm like, okay, awesome. You, you get it. And to me, now I just normalize that. I normalize that for parents. I normalize that for players. I just say, hey, listen, if you're used to watching this, this, and this, that's not going to happen here. This is all by design and this is all by intent, and it's going to be messy. So I think just it's 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 certainly the ego. I mean, there's all the ego involved, but I think a lot of it is just coaching the way you're coached and these historical right. cultural norms of what practice should look like. And to me, you know, it's like a kid was still using a BlackBerry when the iPhone 12 exists. Like why are you using a BlackBerry? And to me, coaches are still using Blackberries because they aren't applying some of the fundamental things that have been researched for the past thirty years about how people learn better. Right. So I, I'd love for you to share a little bit more about the kind of the science behind the learning and discovery process that then connects it to the game. Well, let's take something really simple in terms of uh, blocked versus random practice. Um, blocked practice is, uh, you know, Justin, go shoot 10 shots from the elbow over and over again and then switch with your partner. Well, to me, the problem is, is that in a game, you never shoot consecutive shots in the same way over and over again. It just never happens. The condition is always different. Even a free throw, every free throw, even though it's a static, closed environment, it's still the, the time and score, the situation, who's watching, who's not watching, all these different kind of psychosocial behaviors or factors are all still involved. So every shot is a different, unique shot. So why practice shots repetitively over and over if they're not practiced that way? Well, why, number one, this block practice has value in initial learning, which gives Justin the task representation of what the skill is. And then number two, it helps him build comfort and confidence. Okay, you, you know, you see the ball go in or you feel the shot over and over, it's akin to memorization, right? This memorization is definitely brings comfort and confidence when you go to write a test. So the same thing. The opposite, or what is more game-like, is random shots where it's like a shot from a different spot each time uh, maybe it's a shot you know coming off a different movement each time it's a shot that's uh, you know preceded ideally by a decision and to me that's game like and then people use game speed oh we gotta go game speed and there's another kind of pet peeve for me is like what is game speed like what people mostly really when they think game speed is it's got to be full intensity but what we know about the game is nobody plays full intensity in the game. There are short bursts of full intensity, but the game is full with change of pace. So to me, if you watch one of my practices and we represent the game in practice, playing three and three, four and four, etc., you would always see game speed. And that would not always be fast, and that would not always be full intensity. And I think somewhat we have an obsession with uh, intensity. So this random versus block practice is, again, the difference between playing in a uh, laboratory in a perfect condition versus playing in the reality, which is the game condition. And that's the random practice where it's each shot I have to shoot is uniquely different. Right. Yeah. I, I've, I think about that even for myself as a player, um, cause I still play pickup. So, you know, I think I've really like learned to slow down a little bit instead of always going full intensity because I want to be smarter about how I use my effort and my energy. And part of it is obviously cause I'm not in as good a shape as I used to be. Right. But also with that, like I, I play sometimes with some, you know, I, and I work with high school kids who are incredibly quick and incredibly athletic, but they just go, go, go. And I'm trying to talk to them about slowing down in like, Yes, you can use your full intensity at times, but you don't want to always be going full intensity or it's going to be easy for the, the person to guard you. 
Well, I'll give you a quick example. Like uh, to learn how to go faster, learn how to go slower. Right. To learn how to be quicker, learn how to go slower. Because it's change of pace that makes a difference, right? And Justin will appear quicker to me if he's slow to fast rather than he's fast all the time. I can get used to one thing. I can't get used to variable things. And that just is, again, it just makes sense, doesn't it? Because at this point, Justin, you're not going to change your quickness that much no matter how much you work out. But you can change it a lot by using change of pace and this slow to fast or fast to slow to fast or different things like that. Right. Yeah. That, that, that makes sense. So with that, I'm kind of curious with, um, kind of this, the AAU and just so much travel sports, like where have we, where can we rein some of that in and start focusing back on just like just development and playing the game for fun? Well, I mean, fun is paramount. I mean, to me, if we're talking about retention of a player in basketball, let's talk specifically basketball, but this applies to other sports too. Retention of a player through the pathways, whether it's from, you know, eight-year-old on up to play through high school, it has to connect back to fun. And fun to me is not frivolous fun. It's not playing duck, duck, goose. Fun to me is that they see themselves improving. So one is a coach creates an environment for them to improve, and two is the coach notices they're improving. And too often as coaches, we just simply spend time on noticing when they succeed, when they've learned something, right, rather than the process of learning. So to me, it's like within me in practices, go up to, you know, uh, my daughter, and I might give her feedback on saying, hey, listen, you know, you can do this better, um, you know, and then I'll go up to someone and say, okay, listen, you know, you couldn't do this last week, and you can do it better this week, right? Like, the different information that I can get from players to be able to know something. One might be a technical, tactical detail that, hey, you know, you can improve, you know. And then the other is like, hey, listen, you used to suck, and now you don't suck as much. Well, what's wrong with saying that? Like, why is that a bad thing? To me, we try and normalize the learning process and saying, listen, you're bad before you're okay. You're okay before you're better. You're better before you're good, and you're good before you're great. And there's no skipping steps. Now, you can progress through the, some of those faster and slower, but there's no skipping steps. I mean, you just and me and I were bad at something before we're good at something. So let's normalize that because most of kids drop out because they don't feel like they can do something. So we obviously try and get them to understand that you can't do it yet, but you can do it. And yet being the most powerful word. So we have to spend a lot of time noticing their progress. And to me, that's fun. Improving is fun. Well, what's the second part of that is competing. Being now able to apply those skills in a game. And that's why I spent a lot of time on noticing that's what we worked on. And I can't encourage coaches enough to spend a lot of time on that's what we worked on. Hey, look, well, Justin just did this back pivot move. We work on that in practice. That's what we work on in practice so we can apply it in a game. To me, that's the problem with three men. We've been a lot of these things. We can talk about, you know, its value, whatever. You can argue whatever you want. But I mean, what am I going to notice that three men leave help my players in a game? Right? Like, that's what I want. Everything I'm doing in practice is to help my players improve or to help our team succeed. And if we're talking about development, I'm not worried about our team succeeding. I'm talking about our players improving. And I'll just throw one last thing out of there. Is like, you know, my daughter said to me, said to me a few weeks ago, she said, Dad, I'm not the best 11-year-old in the world. And I'm like, that's good. If you're the best 11-year-old in the world, we wouldn't really be doing our job in trying to help you develop. The goal is for you to be good five years from now, 10 years from now, whatever it may be. The goal is not for you to be good now. If you're good now and perfect now, we wouldn't be challenging you enough so that you feel like you're struggling. And that's another part is to normalize that learning struggle. Is it's my job as a coach to add struggle. If you can do something, by the way, perfectly, you can, you are, you can already do it. And I think we can represent perfect as like, oh, look at them, they're so good, they're perfect. Well, I mean, I'm not doing my job as a coach if they're doing things perfectly in practice. I need to always load them with challenge. Now, optimal challenge, variable learning styles challenge in terms of that, you no, know, but I want to load them with challenge. I think that's a good good place for to go next in terms of like this long term development versus like AAU. I want my kid to be the best twelve year old and like you know on all the highlight reels, YouTube, you know whatever, right? Like we want to like optimally optimally challenge our players right now. So for those that are you know some of them maybe like you know if I'm a coach and I have like a top three or four you know guys or girls on my team that you know seem to like sometimes be cruising through practice. How do you how do you 
you know, kind of like schedule those, that optimal challenge for them. Right. I mean, there's two, uh, two different, I mean, let's, let's do your second part there, which is like, how do you challenge the best players in your practice? I mean, yeah. you know, that's, I'm designing practice for my best players. I'm not designing practice for my three worst players. No, and that's not to mean I'm not trying to help them in practice. I'm going up to them and saying, and I'll give you examples. Like when I run some camps, sometimes it's 80 kids in a gym, and the first thing we start with is three times between your legs, shoot the ball. That's so I can assess, assess the level of the whole camp. Well, inevitably, there's five or six, maybe a few more players that cannot smoothly go three times between their legs. And we're talking 12 year olds. To me, that's a huge problem. Why are you playing basketball at that point if you cannot go three times between your legs? Well, why? Because nobody's ever encouraged them or given them permission to do that. So I know that's the limitation. The limitation is not their ability to actually do it. The fact is they just haven't done it. So in the course of three days at a camp, they're going to be able to do it. And I'll go up to them really early on as we're doing that and go, you can probably notice that most people can do this and you can't do this yet. Stick with me, struggle with this, fight for your learning, and you will be able to do it after three days. And almost without exception, every single one of them will be better after three days doing it. So to me, it's like, Retaining them in the sport or, you know, development over the long term has more to do with inspiring them about the fact that they can improve through their direct effort. And understanding that the value of the coach is to create the environment for them to improve. But the responsibility for learning is on you. It's on the player. And to me, that should be very empowering. And I think too often we've... You know, and again, we've, we've, uh, look, coaches are valuable, teachers are valuable, parents are valuable. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, like, for example, I'm not a motivator. I can't possibly motivate Justin to get better at basketball. Now, I can create an environment for Justin to get better at basketball, but the motivation is his. And to me, that's another part of this process in terms of those things that you talk about, about long term. My focus on long term is to inspiring them, one, that they understand they can learn and are capable of learning and improving. And then two is noticing that so that they keep wanting to go in this environment of getting better. Right. Because improving is fun. And that's why in a, in a, in a healthy way, right? Cause it, cause you don't want to be the person, I guess, let's say you're, you're one of the, you know, I actually, I rode the bench in, in high school, but I mean, I was competitive at least, you know, I was maybe the like better or the okay at the time. And, you know, I had the, my good players, like I was only a few apart. Like I wasn't like a freshman playing on varsity where I'm at, like I pretty much suck, you know? And, and then that's so debilitating and I don't want to do it anymore. It's just about creating that environment of, of kind of like levels. And I'm guessing, right. Like I, I'm thinking about, like, I listen to a lot of, you know, different podcasts talk about like, Oh coach, you need to, you know, plan out your entire year. So for you, I'm curious, like how, yeah, you're like, no, I can already see it. Possibly predetermine what they need to learn. Right. Like to me, okay. I, that means you're, this is just, I mean, to me, that's ancient history, that type of thing. And again, that comes back to our ego. Look at all the planning, look at all the effort. Okay. Go through all that. But then throw it out the window when you go to that first practice and actually determine what they need to learn. Cause why am I going to go in and predetermine that they need to learn how to jump stop if they can already jump stop? To me, that's my ego saying this is a coaching clinic. It's got nothing to do with the players. If it's about the players, then I'm going to create – and I'll give you – can I give you a quick example here? Please. So after I watched my daughter play on her first team, she was a fifth grader. Because of COVID, she had some delays when we moved to California. So she didn't play on the team for about a year and a half until school got back in. She played as a fifth grader on the seventh, eighth grade team. And to me, the proudest moment was that every time she caught the ball and she was in range and she was open, she shot the ball. She didn't make many, but to me, like that limitation on her, right. like not being afraid to shoot. I mean, the decision is more important than the skill. That'll help her develop in the long run more than anything. You know, the other part that I took away from that experience is watching how many loose balls there were, how many just 50 50 balls there were because players, you know, couldn't dribble as well, couldn't pass as well, couldn't catch as well, couldn't rebound as well, and all that stuff. So the first practice I had with her group after watching that was we went in and we worked on just simply just and I taking each other, simply drop the ball, and you have to Z the ball. Instead of pulling it right to yourself, you Z it. And that means you form a group with the ball so that if Justin's trying to reach in at the same time, I'm stronger. So if I predetermine, okay, i got to know how to teach you dribble, jump stop, pivot, pass, blah, 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 then I'm missing one of the most key elements of that age group, which is, Okay, control of the ball. Possession, <laughs> possession is obviously incredibly important. 
right? Projection over prediction is something that we value more than anything. So to me, that directed everything. And my cheating plan would not have had that on it, and I couldn't have accounted for that if I didn't have my mind open to the possibilities of what they need to learn rather than what I need to teach them. Mm. Yeah, you because you, yeah, you can't predetermine. So for me, like I, I'm coaching Frost off this fall. This is my first, you know, high school job. Like I can't, I have no idea, you know, like because with Frost off, it's not like varsity. You know who's coming back. Like I have no idea who's going to be on my team. Zero idea what skills they're they're coming in with. So, you know, I could create like oh this comprehensive list of like we're going to do this in October, this in November, this in December. We're going to be great, you know, whatever. But like that would pro- I'd probably just be wasting my time at that point because you know come october they they either can do this really well or not they don't do this at all and i have to you know address whatever you know ball handling passing xyz well let me give you a quick example because i love that you're making that connection um let's say prepubescence so whatever that is for females and males obviously a little bit different let's say it's around the 12 13 14. okay my, my, if you ask my daughter right now when she has to be good at shooting she'll say after 14. I'm like, okay, now that doesn't mean we're not working on shooting, but to me, her success at that younger age has more to do with dribbling, passing, and ball handling than it does with shooting. Well, almost every coach, prepubescence, would have shooting as part of the practice plan. So to me, instead, we spend zero time on actually the biomechanical skill of shooting in my daughter's practices. We spend time on the decision about whether to shoot or not. We don't spend any time with the actual biomechanical skill of shooting because to me that's a lit, that's a post pubescent type of skill to perfect because a lot of it has to do with your body and your movement of your body and the flow of your body and you know all the different things that are going to change anyways when you get to pubescent. So um, you know if you tell me if you showed me hey, when you talked about that AAU example, oh my son or daughter is the best eleven year old shooter in the country, I'm like cool. You know, I hope that somebody's going to spend time with them after they hit pubescence, and then we'll see what they're going to be after that. Um, but, you know, our foundation is okay, but let's be honest, things change quite a bit over the long spell of what you're calling development. And that's a great example of a, ninth, a rising ninth grader. Like, man, you can have such a diversity of players in that group that uh, you couldn't possibly say this is what they all need. Right. Yeah. And I think that would be my own challenge as a coach, because, you know, we have those challenges as well. Like I am already a better coach than when I started when I was in college, like going straight from player to coach and just yelling out orders and them having no idea what I'm talking about because I played varsity and that I'm coaching middle school rec ball. Right. So with that, I, that'll be my own challenge of, of learning how to do that and meet them where they're at. And I think that's probably part of the process as a coach as well. Absolutely. It's a big part of the process and it's okay to question yourself as a coach, but it's also okay to be able to spend some time with things that you know. And that's the thing. Like if I'm creating the environment for my players, I'm going to create the environment where I'm going to coach things that I know. And to me, it actually simplifies the process, especially if I'm coaching youth or focusing on development like you would be with that uh, ninth grade team. Look, if I'm focusing on development, then it just helps me create a better environment where I'm not worried about teaching them 50,000 things. I'm teaching them the things that can help them have the best experience playing basketball. And to me, skill equals confidence. Skill equals confidence. How do you help a player become more confident? You help them become more skilled. I mean, the most skilled players are confident because they have the most possibilities, they have the most solutions. And to me, that's the that's the constant connection I make back for players. And you'll hear me say that. And my players, like, if they've been to one practice and they've been to seven practices, they will be able to tell me, hey, what, why are you trying to get more skilled? They'll say to be more confident or to have more fun. And both those are good answers, right? Because yeah. that helps them to have more fun playing basketball. The only way to have more fun playing basketball is to be more skilled. So why are you going to spend time on your game on your own? Why are you going to work on your dribble when you're not at practice? Because you get more skilled, which gets more confidence, which allows me to have more fun. That's the most important connection for all players. I think that's a great place to to leave this off on. And I think really wrap up kind of what you're talking about and with the decision making, you know, talking about like, at the end of the day, confidence, fun and skill, they kind of all overlap and they're all kind of building upon ourselves as we go along, we play more, we learn how to make better decisions. So yes, and let's just be clear, a decision is a skill that leads to more confidence. And that's an example. That's why I shared that example about my daughter. 
I will, she never turned down a shot playing against seventh and eighth graders. She was in the most, she was the best player on the floor. She was pretty skilled relative to most players. But what I was most proud of was that she shot in the open shot every time she caught the ball. And I'll be clear, and this will drive coaches crazy. I haven't spent any time talking about defense with her. We not one moment in a practice or any you know, individual workout we spent any time on defense. To me, her enjoyment of the game has more to do with offense and skill on offense than it does anything. And defense is something we can connect for on later. Um, and, you know, I'm probably leaving it on that deep thought, but, uh, you know, to me, this decision is also a part of that skill equation. Absolutely. So with that, the final thing, you know, you have a podcast. I'd love for you to share your podcast. You have an, a ton of amazing guests on there. So that's a great resource for coaches. And then also any any parting words or other places they can find you at for your great content. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this conversation. Please, uh, you know, hit me, tag me on Twitter. If you enjoyed something or you have a question, uh, tag Justin and I on Twitter at B-Ball Immersion. And my DMs are open as well if you have some questions. Uh, basketballimmersion.com is our membership community and we have coaches from all around the world at all levels of basketball from the NBA on down to youth levels in there because we focus more on how to teach than on what to teach and uh, that's a big part of it although you get what to teach as well but uh, the basketball podcast with Chris Arbor, I mean I'm so grateful I mean I think it's about three years ago now that we started it and we're on episode 225 coming up here soon. And, you know, again, NBA, high school, you know, college coaches, I'm just grateful for their ability to be able to share the game and have these honest open conversations like we're doing, Justin, right now, which will stimulate your thinking. So, uh, coaches, please uh, hit me up on any of those platforms, but especially give Justin a shout out for doing this and uh, for sharing the game as well. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast. We'd love it if you would like, subscribe, leave a comment, and a review on whatever platform you're on. It's the best way to help us grow. We appreciate you for doing that. We'll shout you out on social media. I'd also love if you connected with me on social media. Let me know your thoughts, and this is why I do it. I want to share knowledge and wisdom from experienced leaders to people like yourself and myself so we can have this dialogue and move forward and make an impact on the world. So stay tuned, stay subscribed, cheers.